Hello, world. On number 58 of the Concrete Podcast, our guest is Lincoln O'Berry. Lincoln is a filmmaker and activist who, like his father Rick, has dedicated his life to ending the captivity and slaughter of wild dolphins. Lincoln has been traveling to countries all over the world, releasing captive dolphins since he was six years old, including places like Taiji, Japan, which happens to be the birthplace of Japanese whaling. In fact, in 2009, Lincoln and Rick created a documentary called The Cove, which won the 2010 Oscar for Best Documentary Feature. The Cove is a call to action to halt mass dolphin kills, change Japanese fishing practices, and educate the public of the risks of mercury poisoning in dolphin and whale meat. Lincoln also directed and executive produced the award-winning Animal Planet series, Blood Dolphins, which documents the lucrative captive dolphin trade in the Solomon Islands. This podcast really gives a gripping perspective on one of the most brutal and inhumane practices that is still happening in our world today. So without further ado, please enjoy this episode with Lincoln O'Berry. So yeah. thanks again for doing this, Lincoln. Um, Glad to do it. Just give everyone out there who may not know just a brief background on who you are. My name is Lincoln O'Berry, and pretty much my whole life I've worked with my dad. Uh, we have an organization called Dolphin Project, and basically our mandate is for the welfare and protection of dolphins worldwide. And we primarily deal with dolphins with the captivity issue and also dolphins that are being slaughtered in that issue. So how did you get, I mean, obviously your dad is like a, a, a super famous figure in this, in this world. And, you know, he's, you guys have been a part of movies like The Cove. How did he bring you into this whole world? I just got brought into it because it was, you know, in the house when the phone rang, it was usually somebody calling for the Dolphin Project. And so I just, you know, as a little kid, just got you answering the phone, like Dolphin Project and, yeah. You know, well, it was just what I knew. Like, you know, we had like when I was a little kid, we had a facility with dolphins when I was like, you know, a baby. And so I grew up just having dolphins right there, basically at the house and stuff. Okay. Um, you know, he for those that don't know how he got his start, Rick O'Berry, my dad, he was initially the a trainer at the Miami Sea Aquarium, which was, at the time was like the second or third dolphin area in the entire country. And it was located in Miami. And um this was the very early 1960s. And basically when he got out of the Navy, he got a job at the Sequarium. I think his first job was working on their collection boat. And that was the boat that would go out and get all the animals. It would go to the reef and they'd get fish and they'd get turtles and they'd catch dolphins as well. And a lot of them were caught here or in Miami, the original dolphins at the Sequarium. And then uh, Flipper came along and just to a chance meeting one day at the Sequarium, my dad met Rico Browning, who was the director and kind of creator of Flipper. And at that time, they were just shooting the initial pilot, which was actually a movie. Hmm. And um, Rico was the trainer on that the movie. And then it was very popular and got picked up as a TV show. And so they decided to use the back lot of Sequarium to do the series. And my dad had met Rico. And so my dad became the head trainer. Rico wanted to be the director. And so he directed all the episodes and my dad was the trainer. And so they actually went and caught five dolphins that were going to play flipper because you have to have multiple dolphins um, in case one doesn't want to work or some are better at some tricks than others. Yeah. And, um, so my dad helped a year or two before the show even started shooting, helped catch the dolphins. They were in a back part of the Miami Sea Aquarium and then train the dolphins. And then basically, you know, they would shoot all the exterior shots with the dolphins all at one time for all the episodes. So they would come for like a month or five weeks and shoot all those shots. And then everything else was done on sound stages and other locations. And so then my dad was basically left alone for most of the year with the dolphins. And so he lived there right when you see the Flipper TV show, like where Ranger Rick and his family lived, like that's where my dad lived. And he had the dock right there and he would sometimes take the TV set with a long extension cord and put it out on the dock and like watch Flipper with Flipper, the dolphins. And like he lived there with them and he was employed by the TV show and the Sequarium at the same time. So he was like the highest paid person at the Sequarium and was driving a sports car. And, you know, then with the popularity of Flipper, Flipper, the TV series took off like a rocket. So now everyone wants to hug a dolphin, kiss a dolphin, see a dolphin. So now Miami Sequarium, where he works, started catching dolphins and selling them 
I think it was like a female dolphin was like 350 bucks and a male dolphin would be $250. And you could literally pull up in your station wagon to this aquarium and for 350 bucks, they'd load a dolphin into your car and you could drive off. And they didn't know if it was going to someone's house or going to an aquarium or where it was going. And so you saw a proliferation all of a sudden of dolphinariums. They were popping up everywhere with, with the popularity of Flipper. And so um, eventually the Flipper series ended. And those dolphins were partially owned by the TV show and its aquarium, and they were actually just warehoused in the back. They weren't used for shows after that. And my dad, after needed a few some time off, and he was just kind of hanging out, and he gets a phone call one day that his favorite dolphin named Kathy, there were five dolphins that played Flipper, but one he identified with the most and spent the most time with, um, he got a call that she was near death. So he went to this aquarium, and she literally swam into his arms and died. And he just at that moment kind of had this moment of epiphany, like, what have I done? Like, I'm the guy that trained Flipper that made dolphins popular, and now they're popular, and now there are dolphinariums everywhere, and I helped catch a lot of those dolphins. And this was in 1970, approximately right around now. It was like the beginning of April, end of March is when the Flipper died. And so he just kind of didn't know what to do. And so on Earth Day, 1970, which is 50 years, we're selling that anniversary this month on the 22nd. Um, my dad flew to Bimini where they had sold somebody there three or three or four dolphins. Um, it was called the Lerner Marine Laboratory. It was owned by a family that owned a chain of shopping stores called Lerner. And they had... They had their own lab that they created. It's basically their pet dolphins, but they had like kind of like other animals in cages and you could see them and they said they were doing research, but it was really just a family thing. Um, anyhow, all the dolphins had died. There was only one left named Charlie Brown. So on Earth Day 1970, my dad flew to Bimini wearing a green armband in, in symbolic for Earth Day. And he went that night of Earth Day and cut the pen to let Charlie Brown go. And the pen fell away and the dolphin was swimming around. He wouldn't leave. And so my dad got in the pen. He's trying to chase the dolphin out. It wouldn't leave. And finally, he had rent, my dad had rented a little rubber, 12-foot rubber boat with a motor to get out to the sea pen. And it was very high tide. And so he was able to get the boat into the pen and was trying to chase the dolphin out and for hours. And the dolphin wouldn't leave. And eventually, the tide dropped. And now the boat is stuck inside of the pen that he rented. So it's going to come back to him. So he just put his green armband on. He walked down to the office of the Learner Marine Lab, knocked on the door, and basically told him, like, last night I tried to let your dolphin go. So they arrested him. And it was, like, front page of the Miami Herald, Flipper's trainer in a flap. And there's the picture of him being led into jail wearing his Miami Seaquarium T-shirt. He had his Seaquarium T-shirt on. I, he spent, like, four or five days in jail. And then... Um, the judge let him out and gave him a $5 fine and threw him out of the country. And um, about two weeks after that, my dad was in Miami just milling about, what do I want to do? Like, what's going on with my life? Like, you know, what, what? And he actually went sailing with, um, he was best friends at the times with a guy named Fred Neal, who was a very famous folk singer. He wrote the theme song to Midnight Cowboy, Everybody's Talking. That was okay. his big song, but he's got many others. And he was kind of the godfather of the folk music scene. And many other musicians hung around this guy. And um, so Fred that day was going sailing with Stephen Stills from Crosby, Stills and Nash and showed up at my dad's house. And was knew my dad was depressed and was like, come on, come on the boat. And so my dad's out sailing in the bay with them. And they're talking about, you know, my dad just told him what happened. And he quit his job and he just got arrested. And he's like, I think I want to do this. I want to let dolphins go. I want to tear down what I've just built, this monster that I created, this dolphin area industry. Yeah. And Stephen Stills and Fred Neal, loan, I think wrote it right there, wrote him a check. They're like, long as what you do is legal, we're behind you. And they wrote him a check for like five grand. And with that money, my dad went and printed some Dolphin Project t-shirts. And then um, he identified a dolphin in the Keys um, there's a place called Dolphin Research Center in the Keys. It was called, uh, I think it was called Flipper Sea School back then. 
And there was a place where you could pay to swim with the dolphins. And um, a guy named Hugh Downs, he was a famous broadcaster. He used to host uh, 2020 back in the day when 2020 was like 60 minutes. It was a respectable like news show. And um, he owned this dolphin. It was like his pet dolphin. And he left. He it would, it would live at this facility where they took care of it. And whenever he was in the Keys, he'd visit it. It was kind of like Bubbles the Chimp with Michael Jackson, like, you know, the chimp wasn't at Michael's house all the time. It was like once in a while to go visit it wherever it was. Or, um, But so my dad convinced Hugh Downs to let him have the dolphin and that they wanted to release it back in the wild. And so my mom and dad, who weren't married, they were just dating at the time, went down to the Keys, set up a tent. It had a Dolphin Project logo that we still have to this day on, on the tent and lived there with the dolphins. And we eventually moved them up to uh, Coconut Grove, where, we, where I am now. Uh, keep us gain and we set up a facility there where we had the dolphins for a couple of years and then eventually rented a uh, seaplane put the dolphins in it and flew them to the bahamas in wow like 1974 i think 74 75 and just flew around till we saw wild dolphins and landed the seaplane and let them go and that was the first like release of dolphins that the dolphin project did and then, wow. this, and so we basically had that mandate. My dad basically has spent the past 50 years of his life, 50 years on April 22nd, um, releasing, you know, trying to tear down this industry that he created. And no, you know, there's been a lot of like whistleblower, Blackfish had a bunch of whistleblower trainers because my dad has that experience of being in the industry to be able to speak about it. But his, his story is just so unique because he was just there at the birth of the movement and he can, you know, it's not his fault what happened, but he can, he was in that position where he was part of what made dolphins popular and then also catching them. And so he really felt responsible for it. And so he's just, I think the guilt is kind of like led him his whole life. It's almost like he's a vigilante of sorts. You know what I mean? How many times has your dad been arrested or are you, have, have you guys he's both been arrested? arrested um, he's been arrested, uh, a half a dozen to a dozen times, but they were all by design. Right. You know, we went that day, knew that what was being arrested was part of the plan. There was somebody already there to bail him out. Like, you know, okay. You and know, back then as well, you know, we were really seen as the, the, like the cusp, you know, we're on the, we're the fringe. You know, it's just my dad and me in front of an aquarium protesting. There's nobody else there. And so if you get arrested, that's going to get the news there, you know, and like, how do you get on TV? How do you get this issue out there? It's like you do it. You have to. And because back then there was nobody protesting. It was not an issue. It was always in the newspaper. SeaWorld says or blah, blah, blah. Aquarium says and the dolphin project accuses we were always on the defense like our word wasn't as good as their word because they're the experts because they have you know what i mean like they're seen as the yeah. experts they have dolphins in their place mm -hmm. where we've totally flipped that script now now it's completely the other way around like in you know what's happened in the past 10 years has just been a revolution and it took 40 years of work to make we've made it now part of pop culture for it not to be popular to have dolphins in captivity We've been spoofed on Family Guy, on South Park, on The Simpsons. They've all done Cove or Blackfish themed episodes. Um, you know, Harry Styles in concerts that don't go to SeaWorld. 50 million girls the next day, they don't even know what SeaWorld is. They just know God just spoke. There's a place called SeaWorld and they're never going there. You know, right. it's like. So that's like when, it, when you hit that level of pop culture, we've just flipped that script. And it's like all these places are just kind of a dying, archaic, um, like they're built on a model from like the 1950s, like roadside, like biggest ball of twine. See the big lumberjack. See, you know, Wiki Wachi in Sarasota, like the mermaids, uh, mm -hmm. dolphins, on, you know, doing performing stupid tricks. Like it's all this model that's phasing out. Where are we today in regards to captivity of whales and dolphins in places like SeaWorld compared to, say, well, 10, think, 10 years ago? It just depends where you live. Like, um, you know, places that we're working really hard, like I'm working, we have a big project in Indonesia. There I'm seeing the, you know, it collapsing and we're shutting down places and we're confiscating animals. But then you go to a country like China, they're building a new city the size of Miami 
every week, a new city they're building from scratch, every, the whole city of everything. And they're coming online and that city wants to have an aquarium, you know? So you see a huge growth of aquariums in China right now, huge. Really? Um, yeah, because they're literally building entire cities at once right now. And they're building them all over the place. And so, you know, they're building everything at once, all the movie theaters, the aquarium, the, and the, their aquariums popping up. That's probably the biggest, you know, right now, um, the main most famous exporter of dolphins is Japan. And it was, that's where you see that in the movie, The Cove. Right. Probably Japan is probably the number one customer for Japan because they have many dolphinariums. I think Japan is like the size of California and they've got, you know, more dolphinariums in our country does. They have like 50 or 60. And, um, and they're, most of them are pretty bad. So they're disposable dolphins. So they buy them all the time and they get a certain price when they sell them inside Japan. But when they export them to China is when they get the maximum price. And Which is like in the hundreds of thousands, right? They're probably the number two buyer of dolphins after Japan itself. Are they still getting up to like 150 grand for a dolphin that goes into a tank for, you know, for people to come oh, by and watch it? You look at Taiji, Japan. Taiji is where they're slaughtering them, and there's a market there locally in the village for eating dolphins. Right. Neighboring villages don't eat dolphins. It's more of a localized thing in this village. Mm -hmm. And so when you kill a dolphin and you hack it all up, it's worth about $500 in meat. But if they take that same dolphin and export it, to China trained, if they break the dolphin and have some basic training, they can get up to 132,000 is what we've seen. We've seen, you know, a sale for that much per dolphin. Um, un you know, depending on the amount of training, untrained maybe 30,000, and maybe 30,000 is the price inside of Japan for the dolphin. So mm -hmm. clearly the captivity is the underpinning of the slaughter because at $500 a dolphin, they really, these guys couldn't really sustain the lifestyles that they have. These are some of the richest guys, these fishermen in the village of Japan, in Taiji. They drive the nicest cars because you're, they're selling captive dolphins and they're selling them for an incredible amount of money. And even in the movie, there's one point I think I remember when. I mean, there's days when they catch 20, 30, 40 dolphins at once. If you're thinking every 10 dolphin that they could potentially maximum get up, that's $1.2 million dollars. Every 10 dolphin, it's like a day, you know, an afternoon's work to go catch 10 dolphin. It's ridiculous. So split between all the guys, it's like a pretty lucrative business. And the meat, less people are eating the meat, so there's no way they can survive on that. It's the captivity, captivity that drives it. And what for people that are listening that don't know about the, the Cove, the Cove is a documentary and it's about a, a, a place in Japan, a very particular village, very remote. And this village is the birthplace of whaling. Whaling has been going on there for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. It's basically the birthplace of modern whaling is in this village. But in the late 1950s, they started hunting dolphins. So it is not a traditional, hunting whales is traditional and cultural in Japan. Hunting dolphins is not traditional whatsoever. Um, it started in the late 50s after the war and um, they basically go out, it's 12 boats, and they look for pods of dolphins. And when they see them, the boats will get into like, they'll form like a horseshoe shape. And they'll have these poles that are coming from the top of the boat where they're driving the boat down into the water. And where they go, the pole goes in the water, it flanges out like the end of a trumpet. And so they bang on that pole with like a metal wrench while they're driving the boat in this horseshoe shape. And it creates a wall of sound. And with that wall of sound, they drive the dolphins many miles from the open ocean into the cove in Taiji. And forever, we knew dolphins were dying there. But the way the landscape is, where they kill the dolphins, you physically can't see it. They blocked off any entrance to it from the road, the beach. You can't see around this part where they're, we know they're dying, but we just couldn't see it. And so the Cove movie, we were able to finally expose how, what's going on in that Cove. And we were able to take, we worked with Industrial Light and Magic, who does all the Star Wars films. And we made rocks that matched exactly the rocks they have in Japan. And we hid cameras in them. And we went with like a special ops team in the middle of the night and hid microphones and cameras everywhere underwater and trees and drones. And we're able to film for the first time in high definition, like what goes on there. 
And what happens, it's a horrendous slaughter where they basically just drive a spike through the dolphin's head. Um, and what they're doing now is they actually, as soon as they pull the spike out, they put a cork in the hole so the blood doesn't blow out. So we can't get those graphic images anymore of the bay filling with blood. And they've now taken a tarp. They have wires that run across the cove so they can run a tarp across and create like a little sheltered area. Because now we go there as the Dolphin Project. We're there every day during the dolphin hunting season. And with drones, with monitors, we're there every single day. We live stream exactly what's going on. And they try every way to block it. And um, But it's still going on. It just ended on uh, March 1st. And it runs. Every, every, every year, it's still, it's still happening. Every year. It begins September 1st through the and March. And there's a quota. They have... You know, I think it's about an estimate eight to nine species or seven species that they actually get a quota per animal for each species, how many they're allowed to slaughter. And they try to meet that quota. And then they also have orders for dolphins and they'll try to fill those orders. And it's is it correct when in the documentary they talk about dolphin meat because it's it's such a big fish the meat is mammal. so full of mercury, right? It's, well, yeah, it's actually a mammal. Um, but because it's such a big animal, it's meat is full of toxic levels of mercury. So it's right. not even good for you to eat. Right. Uh, well, you know, I mean, generally after that movie and ta- you know, I've met some of the experts and what I've learned is kind of, you don't really want to eat fish that are bigger than your plate because right. the bigger the fish is, the more, the higher it is on the food chain. The higher in the food chain, it's eating things that are eating other things that are eating other things. Right. And so the levels of toxicity build up. And then when you have dolphins that can live 20, 30, 40 years, and they're big, the levels build up in, immensely. And then when you have whales, it's even more so. And, you know, with the dolphin meat, we were finding levels that were 2,000 times the legal limit. And so, and Taiji also has a mortality rate 50% higher than any village of its size. So there's something going on in Taiji, like clearly. And it's and not it's in not any like, other city. And it, mercury poisoning is not something that like, you wake up one day like, <clears throat> I'm sick. Like it's degenerative. So what happens is it's like changing the neurons in your brain and it's changing who you are as a person slowly. So you don't notice the changes, but you're slowly becoming this other person and like, your hearing goes out, you're yelling and like things like that happen that you don't really notice. And so it's hard, you know, they haven't really done the testing that they need to do there because clearly something's going on. And didn't at one point somebody say to the people of Taiji, to the fishermen in uh, particular, let, hey, we'll give you, all, we'll pay you all the money that you're making slaughtering these dolphins if you'll just consider st- stop this killing and stopping the fishing of these dolphins and they refused it because they said it was a, a part of their their culture that they didn't want to give up or it was something no matter what you hit them with they come with some other reason so it's like you know it's not about you know it's it's i've heard the reason it's pest control right like there are no more fish in the ocean because the dolphins ate them all like they've put up charts before where they're like literally saying the dolphins and whales are eating all the fish therefore our fishing it's clearly the overfishing that's causing there's no fish, not the right. dolphins. Well, so they say it's pest control. They say, you know, there are dolphins and fish. There's no difference between the two. So what's the big deal? You know, you guys eat uh, pigs and chickens and cows. And um, there's every reason. So, so. You know, you know but the, what happens with the mercury issue? And, and so. We hammer on it for us. It, it, we we when we're there, we try to portray this not as it's not an animal rights issue. We're not like, oh, they're dull, cute dolphins. You need to save them. We were like, they're full of toxic mercury. These people are eating them. When we first got there, eating dolphin meat was compulsory in the school systems. Like it's no longer like that anymore. But they were forcing the kids to eat dolphin meat because they were trying to make them dolphin eat. So there would be a a pipeline that when they get older, they'll still buy dolphin meat. Like, so they could justify it. They could right? justify it and also create a future generation of people that will buy this product, you know. In Japan, like, everyone's family ate whale meat. After World War II, they were dependent on anything they could eat. 
and you know historically they are a whaling nation and if you go to japan it's very mountainous they have a trouble that's why like all cattle all beef from japan is exported for imported from australia you can't really there's no place in japan to grow cattle so they're dependent on the outside world for their food they're an island and they're the i think fourth largest economy in the world yet they're for their food they're completely dependent on the outside world and so they're very cautious if like one cow gets mad cow disease it's like they stop all imports into japan they shut it down same bird flu same thing they're dependent on china for for poultry but the reality is in japan like 90% of people eat some sort of seafood 90% of the time they eat everything jellyfish fish i mean when you get breakfast there you'll get 10 different bowls you open one there's eyeballs and i mean just all sorts of stuff going on that's just that culture there and so if it turned out that the seafood is not safe to eat and there's mercury that country's in real trouble they've now got a food crisis going on there because now they're completely dependent on the outside world for food they can't sustain themselves and so that's why the government there is so careful about how to approach this mercury there's definitely saw a problem going on in taiji the, the there we were testing the meat all the meat is toxic people are eating that meat there's no warning labels on it pregnant women are eating it old people are eating it um but i think the second the government admits there's a problem it opens up liability that these people can now sue the government everybody could sue the government in japan potentially so it's a pandora's box that we've started with this mercury issue they're not no. like the us that can have their own cows and they can just cut themselves off from the world and do their own thing like they're dependent on the rest of the world for food if, especially if their seafood's not safe which is what they eat for breakfast lunch and dinner aren't they also one of the biggest seafood exporters probably um and that- and it's not necessarily caught there for instance like tuna like the tuna you buy at your store or you go to a sushi restaurant and there's tuna there that tuna might have been in caught in argentina 2 weeks before and then it was shipped to japan where it goes through the tuna auction and then mm-hmm. from that tuna auction it was shipped to a seller a buyer in the states so it's it, you know even though japan may have not caught that tuna a lot of the fish goes through to japan before it goes anywhere in the world that's where they have the big seafood auctions interesting they, they control those markets and um, there's massive, one of the biggest tuna auctions in the world is in the village right next to taiji and anytime you have especially in a place like that where you have like auctions and things like that and cash the mafia is involved the yakuza and so you, there's a big yakuza presence just in the neighboring village of taiji which would make me think they probably have their fingers in the dolphin export business as well yakuza yakuza that's the japanese mafia they're the ones who, the japanese guys full cover t- full body tattoos okay like have you guys IG, you go to any hotel like at the they they're all built on what's called an onsen which is like a natural hot spring every hotel there is built on top of one and there's like you go down in this room and sit in the spring but they all have signs like no tattoos which i even have tattoos a couple and i get problems there are clearly i'm not yakuza but those signs are meant for yakuza they don't want the mafia guys hanging out in the steam rooms really for everywhere down there you see them everywhere have you guys had any run-ins with those guys personally not yakuza so to speak but we have they have an ultra right wing there which would be like mm our version of like you know like maybe like the proud boys or like neo nazis that hang out or like the, they're like that and they even dress similar they'll dress in like high watered pants that are really tight with a button down shirt shaved head like skin heads that kind of dress up and they show up and they they are prone to violence and they're all, they'll do the kind of stuff like one thing they do all the time is they drive with a truck with like a speaker on the top that looks like it's from like the 60s like a giant bell like the most massive speaker you ever seen on the roof of their van yeah and we're there and they'll they'll just go back and forth in front of our hotel for like 20 hours a day like as loud as they can like go home oh berry like shouting threats and like Wow. When the cove was shown for like a week in just a couple theaters in Japan, they found out who the mother is of the owner of the distributor that bought the cove and they went to her house 
and surrounded it and banged on all the doors and windows and like shook her house. Um, it was it was a distributor the the, the distributor, company that but when the cove came out he this uh, distributor in Japan bought the rights to the cove and it only showed for like a week in like two theaters but they went and like threatened his family with violence wow that is insane to so think whether about. that they're doing it on their own or whether that they're just an arm of a bigger operation a yakuza operation that's telling that they're the arm that goes out and handles shit like that stuff like that you know like mm, i don't right you see right. it there it's you're not you know it's not something I'm making up. You the mafia is a clear presence down there. Mm -hmm. Now does does the whale meat in Japan from all the whales they catch does that have high levels of mercury like dolphin too? Yes. Okay. And that you'll find like when you go to Tokyo, you'll find specialty restaurants that you know maybe a few in Tokyo specialty places where you can buy whale meat. Mm -hmm. And um, in Taiji, of course, where the dolphin hunt is. Um, there's tons of places there that specialize it. And in fact, you'll see tour buses coming every week of filled with old people that are taking a specific like whale eating tour from a neighboring big city. They'll come six hours by bus to go to three different restaurants that specialize in whale meat and sushi and stuff like that. Um, because they have some connection to it because after the war, they had, that's what they had to eat. And, you know, mm -hmm. so they had this connection. So it's a really an older generation on its own whaling would die out like whaling is completely subsidized by the government it loses so much money you know i think 40 million dollars or something it loses every year and the government puts money into it to prop it up and what it is you know you said is you know they blame they blame overfishing on the dolphins it's pest control it's uh there's plenty of dolphins whatever excuse because those excuses always change what it really boils down to is whaling is kind of the last vestige and it's like it's their final thing of like you know we're our own because after the war we basically the united states we ran japan we told them you can't have an army you can't do this this is how you're gonna have to now live and to be part of the society because they were outcasts after world war ii and so mm -hmm. um it's one of the last like things they're holding on to. Like you're not gonna, no one's gonna tell us to stop doing this, because none of it makes sense. The whole whaling thing that they have to put money into it, no one's eating it. Right. They have to put it in the schools to try to get young kids interested in it, and you know, in fact, it's full of mercury. Every part of it is bad. So and it's last stubborn vestige of imperialism. Like you're not that you you know you're not the big United States isn't gonna tell us what to do. And even on top of that, the whaling commission, it, it's so interesting how they ha can go out and they can find countries in the Caribbean. All over the world. Yeah. Countries all over the world. They're Small basically bankrupt what, countries they can buy. So how explain to me how that works, how that whole process works and how that benefits them. Well, they'll do it for many different, you know, this is just one. So there's the international whaling commission that mm -hmm. regulates whaling. Japan has left that now. They're not part of it. They just left two years ago because they're like, we're just going to resume whaling on our own and not be part of this. Um, and so, and so what you haven't been allowed to whale for years. And so what Japan did, there's a loophole that you can do some whaling for scientific research. So they just painted on the side of all their whaling ships, a big cross and si wrote scientific research. And like when people would fly over to monitor the hold up signs while they're chopping the whale up saying, we are testing tissue samples, you know, but then the next week in the grocery stores, that same whale he's everywhere. He's in every grocery store. And so um, what Japan would do is to try to control the whaling commission and make these loopholes is they'll go to countries that are not members of the whaling commission, like small, poor Caribbean countries or South Pacific countries. And they'll, mm. they'll build something for them. You know, we'll, We'll build you a new runway. We'll build you a new road. We'll build you a, a fisheries building. That was the famous one in the Caribbean. They'd give them a, they, we'll build you a $10 million, like, you know, half these islands have no building that costs $10 million. Right. We're going to build you guys a $10 million building to house your fisheries offices. Well, they didn't need a fisheries office before that, and they didn't need one after. So a year later, the building's empty. There's chickens running through it. They've got this, they call them white elephants. It's like this project yeah. you build and then just a year later there's weeds growing through it and like and but but for that 
you have to join the International Whaling Commission and you vote how we vote. And we'll pay every year when the meeting, you know, Jan's like every year when there's a meeting, we'll pay for your delegation to fly first class to the meeting. And, you know, we'll give you whatever you want while you're there, your massages and stay in a nice hotel. And so it's a, a win for them. Wow. I mean, you, you think about think about Taiji. The only people benefiting out of it are basically the 40 guys that are involved. The guys that run the boats, their hand, the guys that work on the boats, and the guys that work in the slaughterhouse. They're the only mm -hmm. ones profiting. No one else in the village is profiting. It's these 40 guys, they're a little fishery. They have a dolphin hunting union, and that union is the only one profiting. Japan allowed this to go on, and these 40 guys are the only ones benefiting. The town's not benefiting. The Cove probably did billions of dollars of damage to Japan's economy. There are people that will never travel to Japan again, that will never buy a Japanese car, that will never buy Japanese products ever again because of the, what they saw in the Cove. It was in tens of thousands of newspaper articles. I mean, it was the, the worst PR campaign ever for them. And they allowed it to go on and back up these 40 guys doing what they do. It's just so bizarre. It is, it is so strange to think about it. it it's today, like current day, would you say that that cove in Taiji is the number one source of dolphins in ca captivity? Like, is that where most people are purchasing their dolphins for aquariums or for parks? Year after year after year, I would say yes. But also, I'm aware of a huge export that's happening that most people have no clue out of Cuba. Cuba supplies a lot of dolphins. Really? Yeah. And um, we're looking into that right now. But we, we've gotten, you know, it's, hard, it's a communist country. So to get any government data is almost impossible. But from what I'm hearing from people there, it's an, it could be close to Taiji as far as the export. And I think Taiji... I could look it up. I think it's somewhere around a hundred and something a year or a hundred a year that maybe get exported. Um, Fuck. I don't know if Cuba's like that year after year or this, like sometimes they'll have a spike and there won't be any exports, but you know, throughout the Caribbean you have like in Mexico, I don't know if you've ever been to Mexico, but like near yeah. Tulum, every half mile, there's a place to swim with the dolphins for like 30 miles. They're just one after the other, after another, after another. Yeah. A lot of those are, I think, are coming from Cuba. And they're all, you know, all over the Caribbean. Anywhere cruise ships stop, you'll find dolphins in captivity. And so I'm thinking a lot of those in the Caribbean are coming from Cuba. But Cuba doesn't do the slaughtering like Taiji. No, no. No. But they have a national aquarium where they have dolphins, and they are always considered kind of like Castro's pet dolphins. And actually, if I remember correctly, Che Guevara's niece, his niece, niece or sister, it's his niece, is the, like the national vet at the aquarium. What? And so they're probably involved in the export. You know, I'm sure the higher ups in Cuba are getting, you know, making money off of that. Have, have, do you guys have any plans to go down there to check that out at all? Yeah, and I'm, I live in Miami, so I you know half the people I know are Cuban, and I have friends that go back and forth all the time. So I've had people mm -hmm. looking into it. The other documentary that you guys shot with Pete Zuccarini where you guys go to, I believe it's Indonesia. Is that right? Who's oh, that, that guy? That the TV show I did. Who's we've the crazy a, guy? Pete shot a, he's worked on maybe a couple things we've worked on. We've probably done uh, over a thousand documentaries, but yeah, you know, the Cove stands out because it won the Academy Award. But then we did a TV version of the Cove called Blood, Blood Dolphins. Blood Dolphin, that's what it is. That was like a mini series that I did for Animal Planet. And who was that crazy guy who lived there? He was kind of like, I mean, Chris honestly, Porter. yes. What was his last name? Porter. P Chris Porter. Christopher Porter. Chris Porter reminds me of one of those people who run those, uh, those lion petting yeah. zoos, like in that recent documentary that just came out on Netflix. It's called yeah. Tiger Tiger King. Tiger King. He reminds me just like one of those people, like where he just has that giant swimming pool with all those dolphins in there, and he goes in there and swims with them, and that literally blew my you mind. See correlation with all those people, like you know, there's a bunch of them. There's you know, there's all these. There's a guy on uh, Instagram, the real Tarzan. Someone showed me his account the other day, and the guy's a clown. It's like it's never about the dolphins uh, or the animals; it's about them. 
the animal is the backdrop, and it's always about getting the picture, the Instagram picture, as close as you can with a chimpanzee, with a lion, with whatever it is. It's like any true sanctuary does not let you take selfies with the animal. We don't like our place where we have the dolphins. The general public is not allowed in there. There's no one coming. You can't take selfies. No one's coming and swimming with the dolphins. The dolphins are retired. Like they're just there to be wild animals, and that's what wild animals do. Mm-hmm. Um, I never, you know, there's a huge fascination with the Irwin family, and that you know, for me, he was one of the worst things that ever happened to wild animals, Steve Irwin. You know, really? he comes to zoo, and he's just trying to promote animals in captivity. And you know, before him, when I grew up, all the documentaries, you know, when you saw a great documentary about lions, it was usually by a husband and wife team that lived in Africa for four years with the lions and had the absolute longest lens you could ever have, and got you right in there with lions yeah. being lions. Steve Irwin was all about how close can I get to the animal, and it it was all about a wide angle lens not a zoom lens, like how freaking, you know, how up close on top can I jump out of the truck and land right on the animal? And it changed the, it became a spinoff of shows all about that. And it just changed the relationship. It, it was, it used to be all about being as far away and letting the animal be an animal and seeing the behaviors that, as soon as you introduce a person, the animal's not doing wild animal behaviors anymore. He's doing something else. And so it, it yeah. changed our whole relationship with animals, not for the better, I think. Yeah, there's sort of this weird primal desire that humans have to be next to them or to hold them or to like harness the power of this wild animal. So you see online a lot of these uh, social media so-called sanctuaries and it's the person who runs the sanctuary. It's like they're in every picture. It's like, right. that's not what I want to see. I want to see the animals just being animals, not you. Like, it's not about you. <laughs> yeah, it's so, it's so weird. So the guy, Chris Porter, where, where does he live? He's Canadian. He was he's from Canada. Can, he's from Canada, but doesn't he live in like Indonesia somewhere? He was in the Solomon Islands, but that's all after that show. It all shut down. You see, at oh, the, end, the, the dolphins let go, and he he was he was at, when I was there, he was out of money. Like, really? I was having to give him on a little bit, like twenty bucks every day, just so to buy some food for him and the guys. Like, he had no money. Like, he had bought his ticket to to be on that episode to get there, and showed up with like zero dollars. Like. Because that was fascinating, man. That that was that thing. The way that you guys had to travel to get there to interview the people that were living there that lived off these dolphins. I go there all the time. I usually go there twice a year. Solomon Islands. That's next to Papua New Guinea. What, why do you go there twice a year? What do you do when you go there? Well, it, a couple things. Um, the reason he go went there is because Solomon Islands is probably one of the only places in the world where they traditionally hunt dolphins. They've been doing it maybe because it's an or only an oral history there, but it could go back 500 years, 600 years that they've been hunting dolphins. And in Solomon's, they've kind of mixed like dolphin hunting and like Christianity and like Judaism into almost one thing where like, you know, some people equate when they're sliding the dolphins that it's the blood of Christ. And then they're, in the Solomons, it's very tribal, and so they do a dowry when they get married. And this, the villages that do the dolphin hunting, dolphin teeth is a very important part of the dowry when you get married. Every wedding, the bride and her whole family are dressed in head to toe wearing dolphin, you know, headbands and big ornate necklaces, and they string dolphin teeth together to form like strings of like almost like money. And so it's very symbolic for them. Um, and so what the dolphin dealers and dolphin hunters, people that sell dolphins to aquariums, realized countries that will allow people to slaughter dolphins will probably allow us to catch a few of them and export them. So people like Chris Porter realized, oh, they're slaughtering dolphins in the Solomons. I bet we could probably export. If they're catching them already, we could just pay them a little extra to catch them for us, and we could export them out of the country to aquariums. And so that's what he did. And so he created a mess where tribes there were going and just catching dolphins and, you know, Chris Porter wouldn't be around, he'd be in Canada and they'd just catch the dolphins and have 30 dolphins penned together and they tried to keep them alive until Chris Porter showed up. They didn't know if he was coming in a week or a month. And these are villages that are barely, they're catching one fish to feed themselves for that day. They're and living now, in huts. And now they're having to feed 30 dolphins for some guy that might give them money. And so it just created disaster scenarios where, you know, dolphins were being caught and dying in these pens. And 
the villages were getting upset and warring with each other over money, some white guy, and like, so I've been continuing, I um, mean, if you see blood dolphins, there's a tribe called Fanale, they're the specific tribe that really hunt dolphins to this day. And I've been slowly working with them to see if they will move away from dolphin hunting. And so I built them like schools and I've been providing the kids educations and um, different kinds of grants to the villages as the numbers of dolphins decrease that are killed. And um, Now, do you go there with like a team of people or? No, I go by myself or I go sometimes with, um, there's an anthropologist that I work with. She lives in Miami and she did her doctoral thesis on that village back in the 70s. And so I go with her a lot just because she knows the village. They, she's been going there so long, and um, I can okay. speak their local language now, but I couldn't when I first went there, so it was helpful. Yeah. Now, obviously, there's a controversy when you talk about dolphins, A, being, I mean, there's a difference between people paying hundreds of thousands of dollars of do for dolphins to sell tickets to their aquarium, but what about when there's dolphins that were injured, like, for example, in Clearwater, there's this dolphin named Winter who had its tail whose tail was caught in a net. They had to surgically remove its tail and build it a build it a prosthetic tail. And you know, their claim to fame at Clearwater Marine Aquarium is that they'll sort of rescue dolphins who have been seriously injured and that can't survive in the wild by themselves and they'll take care of them there. Right. So that dolphin, I mean, it, it was, that dolphin was probably gonna die. And now they've rescued her, and she's living now in a sewage treatment plant that 600,000 people a year have to want to see her and clapping and screaming at her. Like, she, what did she get saved from exactly? I'm not sure. Like, that, yeah. that, literally, that place was a sewage treatment plant. That's an the old Clearwater Marine Aquarium. That's the old sewage treatment plant for Clearwater. Um, how many dolphins have they released? Since, uh, since, since that movie came out, how many? None. Right. That is, that is it's just, it's pure exploitation. It's like, just because you make a sign that says rescue, rehab, and release, or a sanctuary, doesn't mean that's what it is. Like, they literally, I think in 2015, when that movie came out, they had 800,000 visitors there. Every one of them wants to see Winter. Winter is in an old, round sewage treatment tank. There's nothing, when you go to a zoo, even the snake gets more consideration than the dolphin. When you look at the snake in his tank, there's a rock and a stick. And if the snake wants to get away from people, he can go behind this, the rock. The dolphin is not gonna completely barren. There is nothing in that tank. She can't get away. The, the winter's just stuck all day. Every kid is screaming at the top of their lungs in a line. And then you walk past winter right into a gift shop. That's what it's all about. It's just about exploitation and money. Right. If they wanted to do something with Winter and Rescue her, the ocean is literally 50 yards away. Why don't you build a sea pen right there? Why is she in a sewage treatment tank in a building? That's not rescuing. They've kept right. her alive, but that's not living is doing things. If you're not doing things, you're not living. That dog is that dolphin is just existing. It's a very sad situation. It's pure exploitation. Yeah, that guy, and there's the guy the head of it, David Yates. Like when that movie came out, his bio on his Twitter was Winter's agent. I saw that. Like, what is that? Like, it's so cringe, that guy. Oh, I, I mean, I helped work on that movie and I had no idea about any of this. And it's just, it's, how can we exploit this situation? You know, and it's like now they're talking about building this massive new facility. Well, that massive new facility is going to need more dolphins that they to generate income to get people in there. It's just a revolving door of like misery. And it, and it, it is massive, man. I drove by it the other day. It is, they are expanding it. It's now it's gone to like four stories, I believe. And we have the only dolphin sanctuary in the world. I built it for about $75,000 in about three weeks. Done. Yeah. The open ocean. The dolphin yeah. can look up. She can, the dolphins can see the stars at night. They're in the open ocean. The tide comes in and out every day. So there's a current to move against. There's little sounds of the snapping shrimp. There's fish that's swimming in and out of the pen. That's living. At least that's some sort of something. Right. They're just existing. And it, for what purpose? Like there is, I, the, I have yet to hear any justifiable reason for having a dolphin in captivity. Like they're not ambassadors. A dolphin is no more an ambassador than 
for dolphins than like Mickey Mouse is for mice. Like these are just caricatures of the animals in the wild. They're not, they don't represent the animals in the wild. They're not doing any behaviors that the animals in the wild do. Like this is just a forced together group of dolphins that we've made. And like, you know, oh, well, if the children don't see them, then how are they going to learn about them? We're educating 100 million, you know, 100 million people come through SeaWorld every year that we're educating. That is ridiculous. Like, I know eight-year-olds, the average eight-year-old boy knows like half of the scientific names for dinosaurs and the crustacean period that they lived in. We've never, who's seen a dinosaur? I've never seen a dinosaur. Yet kids know a name of every freaking dinosaur and what, what period they lived in. Elephants we've had since the beginning of time have been in captivity and they're on the verge of extinction. I've never, I work with dolphins. I've never in real life seen a blue whale, yet the blue whales came off the, the endangered species list without anyone seeing it. So there's no correlation seeing an animal and saving it. Like, the, if that were true, I think they say in Japan, like, yeah, you know, I forget the number, 100 million people a year go through their aquariums. Well, if all those people are going through the dolphinariums and are educated, when the dolphins are being slaughtered, where are all these people? I'm, but I'm there by myself. Like, where are they? You're not getting any education. You're not leaving Miami Sea Aquarium and being told that these dolphins are dying. Like, this is what you can do. You don't don't eat tuna. Like, dolphins are dying in tuna nets or being slaughtered. For you don't get any of that. Like, there, mm -hmm. there's no education happening there. No. Was the and you video... Think dolphins, you think about all animals in captivity. Like, the most modern zoo now, they try to make it like the elephants are on an island. There's like a moat. And there, it looks like wherever... And they're just being elephants. The dolphins are, are literally evolutionary, the highest animal, and yet they're the only ones left that have to perform six times a day, seven days a week. There's a show begging for their food, like yeah. doing the stupid, the dumbest tricks, wearing a Christmas hat or a fake beard or putting out a fire. It's like, that's like the 50s, some clown thing from the 50s. Like, yeah. No, it literally is. It's the dolphin version of Tiger King. It's just absurd. Like, that really painted a very clear picture of it. I mean, especially rang true with me with just thinking of that guy, Chris Porter and David Yates. He's kind of like the Chris Porter of Clearwater in a way. And now with me, you know, there's zero excuse because like I went like four years ago and I made the day the very first VR rig came out or a, a rig for GoPros where you could shoot virtual reality. Okay. The day it came out, the next day I had it literally. And I went and shot the very first underwater swimming with wild dolphins. It's on our website, Dolphin Project. Um, if you watch it on our Facebook page or through YouTube, you get the 360 effect. Uh, oh, cool. And it's basically you swimming with a pod of wild dolphins. It's narrated by Ian Summerhold and the actor. And, um, and I made that for like 10 grand, that thing. And so the whole point of my video was like someone like SeaWorld could spend a million dollars. I mean, one, the last orca that sold in captivity was $15 million. And then they had to probably had to build a $30 million tank and then the upkeep. For a million dollars, you could make the most incredible virtual reality experience where the whole group of people comes into a theater, puts on the goggles, and you're in the wild swimming in a pot of wild. Or it'd be incredible. So yeah. I, we can do that for 10 minutes. Like, we don't need dolph We don't need animals in captivity anymore. With VR, augmented reality, 3D, you can do incredible things that are far more immersive than any experience you're ever going to have in a zoo. Like. So do you know any statistics on how many aquariums, like aquariums or SeaWorld locations there are in the, in the U.S. right now? I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. And like what's like what is like the trend with with those places right now? Like what's going on with them? I know orcas. In the U.S. we're going – I would say it's going down. Mm -hmm. Like um, – you know, you had the cove, which created this wave of people now that love dolphins. And then you had a second hit with blackfish. So the wave got bigger. Yeah. And um, so places that were new were on the drawing board basically aren't happening because, you know, and then places like a recent place that had opened up in Arizona. Um, there's one company that owns most of the swim places in with dolphins in Mexico. And they started infiltrating the U.S. and they had opened up in Mexico, in New Mexico. Mm. <laughs> And they had a dolphin death and there was just some local people that were protesting all the time. And then they had another death and then uh, they had a third death 
and we got involved and we actually uh, helped organize a couple protests right after the third dolphin death. And there was a huge golf tournament, like the, one of the biggest ones in the country. And so I rented a plane with a banner that said, uh, Dolphin Eris, why are three dolphins dead? And we flew it over the golf tournament. It was like something 200,000 people were on the ground at this golf course watching. It was to live on TV. And they actually, the TV camera, the golf thing panned up to the camera, panned up to the plane. You see it on TV on the thing. And plus all the local media covered it. No way. Why it's flying around, another dolphin died. And I literally had to fly in because all the banner planes were being used for the golf tournament. There was no numbers. I had to change the dolphin number for three to four because now four dolphins had died. Literally, as I'm flying the, the banner, a dolphin died. We had to fly in the number four from California on another plane. And, and we flew the banner the next day at the tournament. Why are four dolphins dead? And when the people saw that, it just crushed the place. And so with that an aquarium? Within a week, they were done, and the dolphins were shipped off out of the country. Wow. And so there's that kind of groundswell. Like, you didn't see that 20 years ago. But 20 years ago, it would have just been my dad and I, and we would have looked like freaks, and they would have played us off as we're some fringe people. But now, literally within days, hundreds of people were in front of that place protesting. And, like, that's it, incredible. We just changed that, you know. Now, yeah. your dad lives in Denmark, right? He lives in Denmark. Is there, is there a, reason that he lives there or is it like just a personal oh, no, he thing married a woman from he married a danish woman and she lived okay. there for many years but when the okay. code came out probably for the three years after the code was out he basically was that because when you have a movie that wins an academy award like that you're just on the road it's just week after week somebody's wanting to screen it somewhere you know the president of some country or and you can't say no it's like this could be an opportunity so he was just on the road so much she felt like if she he wasn't around, she'd rather be back in Denmark than here. Mm -hmm. So he they've just moved over there. Okay. Now is he is he still how active is he still with really active? Like I was just with him. We were in but right before the quarantine, we were in Bali where we have a dolphin sanctuary and we were preparing two dolphins that we're gonna attempt to release there. And um but now with what's going on, you know, he's 80 years old. It may not be safe for him to travel for a couple of years now. We, we'll, we'll see what happens. But up until now, he travels constantly. So for, when you went to Bali, for example, can you walk me through, like, what your guys' plan is when you go there and, like, what steps you guys take to release these dolphins? When I went to Bali, I used to, I had a TV show, Blood Dolphins, and I was just I was thinking about doing an episode there, so I went to investigate it. Um, cause when you're doing a TV show, you want to find places that are rich where they have more than one dolphin story. Like Solomon's, if you watch that episode, there's, you know, Chris Porter, the dolphin dealer and his facility, and I'm trying to shut him down and get the dolphin dealers out. And then this village is hunting dolphins and killing them. And I'm trying to stop that. And then there's some guy that had some dolphins in his backyard and I'm trying to shut. So it, it had a lot of stories and angles. And so when you're doing for television, it's helpful to have a lot of things like that. And right. so Indonesia was another place where there's a village that hunts dolphins. You had a traveling dolphin circus, the last traveling dolphin circus in the world. And then you had tons of swim places in, in Bali. And so it had many things going on. And so mm -hmm. um, I decided to do an episode there. And then that led on to us beginning a campaign for 10 years uh, in Indonesia. And so... One campaign, like I said, was um, Free Bali Dolphins, which is, Indonesia, Indonesia is a massive country, but most of the tourism is based in Bali. And so that's where all the swim with dolphins places are popping up. And so I was like, if I can get rid of all of them here, that'll be a massive step. There are other places in Indo that we'll work on, but that's a big one. It's, um, and so that one, I, you know, I work with people that are, so similar to me, I have people on the ground there that work for Dolphin Project full time on this. And we would do, we created a puppet show about why dolphins should be in captivity. And two of them that travel continuously every week in a different school, like around, you know, hundreds of schools. Okay. Um, Bali is one of the capitals right now for graffiti. All the biggest street artists in the world are all stopped passing through Bali. It's everywhere. And so. I bought thousands of dollars in paint and gave free paint to any artist that would do a free Bali dolphin mural. And so they're everywhere. You go every city block 
there's a massive dolphin, free volley dolphin, and it's repetition. It's like, um, like the Obey poster. Yeah. You just see them so much. It's like a repetition thing. So we have so many of these free volley things. It's like you just you see it block after block. Um, I rented every video monitor at the airport. Like when you get off and you're waiting for your bags for 30 minutes, the the screen had an animation I ran for free. Don't swim with captive dolphins in Bali. And I just hammered for years and years and years and just did press. And like, um, eventually we became partners with the actual government. Uh, we have a partnership with the forestry department who manages all the dolphin issues. And so any dolphin issue that arises in Indonesia, they call us. And so, um, Years ago, I created, we call it Camp Lumba Lumba. We actually found this national park where it turns out all of the dolphins in Indonesia are being Ill illegally captured out of this park. And so we built a facility there. That's where the dolphins that will be released will go to that facility because chances are their families still live in that area. They're, they're resident dolphins. Like when you see the cove in Japan, those are what's called transient dolphins. Those dolphins are swimming along, migrating thousands of miles along the coastline of Japan. Okay. And they happen, unfortunately, to trip, come along the coastline near Taiji. Um, certain places have resident dolphins. Like in here, Miami, we have dolphins here that every time you go in your boat, you see the same dolphins. They just live in this area. They're not ever moving. And so... Um, there's a huge resident pod in this area. And so we found the fisherman. We've been able to identify who was actually catching them and how he was doing it. And what, what was happening is the aquariums would call this village and say, we want to buy three dolphins. Mm -hmm. So the expert fisherman guy, he would go out and catch three dolphins. And then he would basically phone it in as like, I accidentally caught three dolphins in my fishing net. Can you call the aquarium to come rescue them? Wow. And the aquarium rescues them and they never let them go. And that's like, there's about 70 dolphins in captivity in Indonesia that were all obtained that way. And so what I did is I built, I'm like, I built basically the first ever permanent release facility because we've released dolphins in the past, but it was always like a specific dolphin in Brazil, Flipper. He's one dolphin. We built the facility. We let him go. The facility got torn down. Because there's many other dolphins in captivity there, I decided to make something permanent that's been there for about 10 years. Then recently in Bali, we just shut down a uh, hotel called the Melka Hotel. And it was a hotel that they basically had dolphins in the swimming pool and they built some other pools. And they the guests could swim with dolphins. They were advertising dolphin-assisted therapy. So they were getting a lot of families from Russia with autistic kids paying huge money to swim with the dolphins. And it got sold and the new, and it's, it's been going, it's always been a horrible place, but it's recently went really downhill. And so forestry department called us and said, well, look, we're going to shut these guys down. We either you guys take the dolphins or we'll move them to another t facility. We didn't, I didn't have anywhere to take them. So I literally, we went, we confiscated two of the dolphins. We put them in a swim with place and we rented some of their pens with the agreement that we're just going to keep them there for like two weeks. You can't, you just feed them. Do not let people swim with them. These, you know, these are our dolphins. We're going to rent your pens. And in two weeks, I built a facility up in North Bali. And we've now moved the two dolphins that were still at the hotel and the two dolphins we had originally confiscated are now in that facility. And that facility is going to be where all dolphins now, when they're confiscated, will go there. And it, we determine there if they're candidates to be released. The ones that can be released, we would take and fly them to our other facility that is an area where they were captured so that if they're released, they'll be released there. The dolphins that can't be released, like we have one now that we're sure because he has no, most of his teeth were removed and he was in a pool with no filtration. So he's been almost blind. And so he's not a candidate and he's been, and he's pretty old. And so he'll live out his life at our facility, retired and just living life. He doesn't have to do anything or work for a living or, you know, so those facilities that you have that you have set up, those are basically in the ocean, right? They're just kind of like blocked off from the, so they can't. The one you know, that's released the facility is in about the deepest part is 15 feet, and so it's actually connected to the bottom. It's poles that go down into the sand, and then has netting. Okay. The one that we have now that is the um, the retirement center. 
is in 60 feet of water and it's 45 feet deep. So it doesn't touch the bottom. It hangs. Okay. And, um, the dolphins, the ones that are retired will be there forever. Now, have you ever seen any kind of problems with these dolphins when you do release them back into the wild? Even if they are resident dolphins, do they ever have any sort of problems like reconnecting or psychological issues? Because, I mean, these o- animals well, are obviously incredible. Speak, definitely. So there's two things. All dolphins in captivity, any dolphin, can be readapted. And that means getting it out of its concrete chlorinated box and moving it into a sea pen where it can, you know, the natural rhythms of the sea and not doing shows. You know, we don't feed. When we feed our dolphins, it's not at the exact same time every day. Because in real life, you're not eating every day at 4.30. You're eating sometimes you're missing a meal. Sometimes you're eating at 8.30. Sometimes, so that we mix it up so it's more like real life. And um, so all dolphins can be moved into a situation where they're in a natural sea pen. Those that then we feel are showing interest in the wild could be moved to that next stage of possibly being released. And so you're looking for different things like, you know, I've, we've seen a dolphin before. Like we, we, this one in Argentina we worked with, or Colombia, sorry. Um, Stefania, we built a sea pen out in the islands where they, she was captured. We moved her from the tank where she was to the sea pen. We built this huge sea pen off of the beach. Mm-hmm. We used the beach as one side of it and then built three squares. And she went to one corner and did the same circles that she did in her look. Cause she was in a little round pool that she lived her life in just going in circles. And we moved her to this massive pen and she just went to one corner and did circles. And that was it. And so she was not a candidate to be released because like, it's like prison. It's like some dudes go to prison and after 40 years walk out, like nothing happened. And there's other people go to jail for two years and they, they lose it. And they're not the same person ever again. And it's, it's so we do have a protocol for, releasing dolphins but it's really a case-by-case basis one thing doesn't work for all of them it's like right so you want to see things like we'll slowly start decreasing the amount of like live fish we're giving them the frozen fish that they're so dependent on and we'll start catching like we catch live fish and we put it into a pen that's hanging in their pen so they can see the live fish they're interested they know it's something because we've got it in a pen so it's special and we get them interested in it and we'll start taking those fish and throwing them. And hopefully you'll see the dolphins at first. Maybe maybe they're not eating them, but they're just having fun catching them. And so you want to start to see that kind of stuff where some dolphins just aren't interested. And so they're not going to be candidates. Right. You know, maybe if wild dolphins come near, are they curious? Are they ignoring it? Or are they seems like they're sending signals out? Like, you, so you're starting to look for those signs. Okay. And then as you get, you know, once you remove them from where we are now, to like the release facility there there were more like observing them through a blind so we'll set up like a wall of palm fronds where we can see through that they can't see us and so we start to break that connection with man and and start to feed them where they can't see us and you start to just slow and while you're doing that you're watching it are they moving forward does it seem like they're they're digging this and like you know it's obvious some start eating that live fish and boom, right away, they're like, oh, yeah, I remember this. Like, I'm all about this. And some aren't. Oh, yeah. That's amazing. And how many how many dolphins would you estimate that you guys release on we, a yearly basis? or Not on a yearly basis because, you know, there was a period where we did a bunch like maybe in the 90s and then it stopped. And then, mm-hmm. um, like, we just helped – they just did a release in South Korea and my, we, my dad went there a couple times and they just basically followed his protocol and we just talked to them all the time. But including those, I think that was like six dolphins. I would say maybe 20 to 25 we've been involved with one way or another. Wow. That's amazing. So what's it going to take, man? What do you think is the next thing that's going to really kind of, kind of, Dolphins make more money in captivity than any other animal. So the threat is bigger. You know, the, the pushback from the industry is a lot bigger because there have been elephant sanctuaries for God knows how long, 30 years. There's Even more so than orcas, like Shamu? I mean, that, well, dolphins pull in more than that? I include orcas. A dol- orca is a dolphin. Orca is not a whale. Orca is the largest member of the dolphin family. So an orca is actually a oh, really? So when I say or dolphins, I'm talking okay. well. And I okay. think there's actually only one whale 
in the United States in captivity. I think it's on the East Coast somewhere. It's just one obscure like species. So basically everything you see in captivity is a dolphin. So I guess my question was, what but all do you dolphins, think? Yes, could be moved in. All dolphins could be readapted into a sea pen and mm -hmm. retired with dignity. And every what? animal has that except for marine mammals. Every, every animal's had it for many, many years. There's been giraffe sanctuaries and primate sanctuaries. They're all over the world. They're, they're forever. Dog, cat, everything. Every animal except for dolphin. Because dolphin in the right place will make more money than any other animal. So what do you think it's going to take to kind of uh, change this this cultural thing that we have going on in the world? I mean, obviously, it's a huge economic lift to these what, companies. Well, we'll see what happens after this virus. I think we're going to live in a different world. Like right now, there's not one dolphinarium open anywhere in the world. Right now, there is not one dolphinarium mm -hmm. open. And how long can they hold? We're gonna, you know, you're going to see half the restaurants in your town are going to be gone. Places you grew up eating at are going to be gone forever. Your movie theaters probably after this, there probably won't be an AMC movie theater anymore. Like things are going to be gone. It's going to change things a lot. And I think yeah. half of the dolphinariums won't make it through this. Easily half of them won't make it. SeaWorld stock right now is in the gutter. Like mm -hmm. how many months of this can they, how many months can they not be open? Before is they, that something that you guys have talked about? Have you guys, have you guys had discussions well, about In Indonesia, I've just doubled the size of my facility in the past 30 days. I'm ready. All right, my staff is ready. We're, any place that closes, we're ready to take all their dolphins. I can take every dolphin right now in Indonesia. We're ready to go. So you guys are kind of anticipating that this is going to happen to these. Absolutely. And wow. we can replicate what we've built in Bali. That can be replicated in Mexico. It can be. Uh, we're going to see places closing left and right. Wow, man. That is. It's expensive to keep captive dolphins. They eat a lot of fish every day, and you got to have a big staff. We have a full time veterinarian. Like most facilities don't have a full time vet, they have a guy that comes once every few months. Like it's not cheap to have all that. Like mm -hmm. how long can they hang on? Yeah. No, it's, it's very interesting how there's kind of like this weird silver lining in this whole virus thing, how it's changing. It's turning around the environment with pollution as far as pollution goes, water pollution, air pollution. And then now this with with animal captivity, obviously people can't be going to zoos or aquariums. I think this will change our entire relationship with animals. That would be a benefit if it came out of it because the whole thing was started by eating animals. And like, um, you know, every animal place – Right now, there's no, they're not open. And how long can they do that for? And do people, you know, and then when it's not like the, the country's not going to open up like Thursday and it's back open. Like it's going to, we're, we're all getting used to this. Like you think you're going to shake someone's hand ever again, ever again. Right. You think that's going to change? Like there's things that are just done. Like when and if the economy, I mean, I mean I'm going to say when the economy <laughs> does start to come back, I don't think. I mean, it's safe to say that zoos and aquariums are not going to be the first place people go to. No, nightclubs, movie theaters, zoos, no. These right. are the last places anyone's going to. Right, well, exactly. And so what are they going to do? Like, you know, I, I totally anticipate, like, them removing every other seat on an airplane and doubling the price of tickets. Like, I'm anticipating that's what the air travel will get more exclusive. But, like, can they afford to only let half the amount of people into SeaWorld and charge twice as much? Probably no one's going to pay $200 to go to SeaWorld. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I just don't see that model working. And like, you know, it was stupid. They had their chance. Like when Blackfish came out around that same time, there was also a big push against Ringling Brothers Circus and the elephants. And so they finally threw in the towel and said, we're getting rid of the elephants. And then a year later, after 180 years in business, they were out of business. Like, it's just a, in SeaWorld didn't see the writing on the wall. They doubled down on animals in captivity where they should have been backing off because you go to SeaWorld, half of it is roller coasters and roller coasters where you wear VR goggles. Like they have such an opportunity to do such an amazing thing. They could have a fucking a theater that holds 200 people with one guy hitting a green button and a red button to start the show. And that's the only cost after they spend a million bucks making the VR film. And they'll have the most unbelievable experience in the world. Mm hmm. Instead, they've got to have dolphins, and they got dolphins, they got us. They got problems, they got people protesting, they've got controversy, they've got overhead. What do these people say that run these places? What do they say? What is their response to you? Like, what would these they say to you right now? Things like that is corporate. Like, of course, like, you know, 
the people that are working day to day with the animals are well-meaning people. Like they, you know, they, they think, well, if I quit my job as a trainer, who's going to take as good care of the dolphin? They all want the best care. It's the corporate heads, you know, of course you look on the bottom of SeaWorld's website. It's, it's called the SeaWorld entertainment corporation. They're not an educational, they're an entertainment corporation point blank. Mm. And so it's just, so what, 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 would those corporate figures at the top of SeaWorld that basically you, they see you as one of their biggest enemies, they see you as the people that are trying to take them down. Have you listened to any of them? Have you had like a discussion with any of those people? Have you listened to them respond to movies like The Cove or respond to movies like Blackfish? Do you know what they're well, like? They denied. In fact, there's a massive lawsuit. They've lost all their initial hearings where, you know, the first year after Blackfish came out and their stock went in the toilet. They said they were. It was. It was affected by weather on certain dates, or that holidays fell. They said every excuse but blackfish. And now all those investors are suing. Like that could be the end of SeaWorld if they win this lawsuit, because all the investors are suing that you screwed us. You lied point blank that it was having no effect when you were internally freaking out. Like, you know, I I don't get it. It's just you know, it's like without the orcas, they lose. The orcas are the draw. We have a place here, Miami Sea Aquarium in Miami. They have Lolita. The day Lolita dies and is gone, like they're closed to that. They're done two months later. That is what keeps that place going. And so it's just a matter of time. Yeah. It's just money. Mm -hmm. That's all that you're saying. Like, why? It's just, why do they have to keep going? It's money. But I think they would make just as much money as a theme park that was aquatic themed and had vir used virtual reality and 3D and all the different things we have available and augmented reality, you could do something amazing, amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I really appreciate your time doing this, man. I've learned a lot. Um, and if people want to know more, they can go check out our website. I hope you'll, you'll put a link. Dolphin Brothers. Yeah, yeah. Tell me, tell me uh, all your social media links and what your websites are so people can listen to, go find them. And I'll My also link them below. Dolphinproject.com and on uh, Instagram and Twitter and Twitch. We're at uh, Dolphin underscore project. Um, you, all of our accounts on all our all the social media platforms are all verified. So you'll know that it's us. And um you guys update the website almost monthly or weekly on the projects you guys are working on, where you guys are traveling. Oh yeah, it's updated constantly, and we're writing. We have a full time staff that's writing new blogs, and I think social media posts goes out every four hours, twenty four hours a day. We're very active social media, and we're live streaming all the time. And um, you know, people, there's a tons of stuff people can do on the website. It just depends on their time and involvement. But the most simplistic thing people can do. It's just don't buy a ticket to a dolphin show. And as simplistic and easy as that sounds, it's all driven by supply and demand. And if you don't buy any more tickets to dolphin shows, you don't go on cruises that have dolphins, you don't stay in a hotel that's got dolphins, they'll go out of business and they'll get the message. That's the only thing, the way they get the message. Mm -hmm. Corporate America, or corporate anyone. Yeah, I think it's definitely starting to, uh, I think the scale is starting to tip now and people are definitely starting to realize that more and more as you know people like yourself and your father and and there's lots of other people that are very vocal about it and talk about it on shows like this and literally 20 years ago it would be us by ourselves in front of an aquarium now we host an event called empty the tanks we're simult well not this year but every year previous like simultaneously we protest like 170 different facilities around the world at the same day at the same time like you know, now it's become this giant groundswell movement. And so we just helped to gu guide that movement. Now it's kind of changed our work a little bit. That's incredible, man. Well, thanks again. And uh, hopefully we can do this again in the future. Appreciate it. Really enjoyed it. <laughs>